And we're back. This is Columbia Calling, episode 432. I'm here in London, and Emily's here in London too. I apologize for my children in the background. Welcome, Emily. How is the recovery going? Really, really slow. <laughs> <laughs> we are three minutes away from one another, but we have to do this virtually. <laughs> we do. I've had a very unpleasant week with a very unpleasant variant of COVID, which all of London seems to have. So it's nice to be part of something, <laughs> uh, but it's very unpleasant to be part of this. Now, is this the B5 or whatever it's called or something of that nature? I'm afraid I've got no desire to give it a name whatsoever. <laughs> it's taken six days of my life. I will not be giving it any more of my the brain. The plague, the hell. Mm, and I think some plague. of our listeners have it too. I think they've mentioned it. So it's going around everywhere, but I'm glad you seem to that be on is. the comeback trail because when you sent me the voice message for two weeks ago, I guess it was for that. It was like, I, I mean, it, I've heard toads croak more clearly. <laughs> this is, I think, the best I can put it. <laughs> yeah, stage, stage one of this particular <laughs> brand of plague was just the most extraordinary sore throat. And really, I mean, I, I looked as much like a toad as I sounded. I was really swollen up and weird. It was... um. It was awful. And in Colombia, they're talking about a fifth wave as well. Uh, and they are talking about face masks. Um, again? So I'll be, again, yeah. So I'll be headed back to that soon. So will Richard. So that's something to look forward to. I didn't know. I've been... And, and the other thing is, people are saying on Twitter, this is unrelated but related, that it seems to be no coincidence that we are back in the UK when Boris resigned. They seem to think it's connected. <laughs> I would love that to be the case. I would give the limb of anybody's choice to take credit uh, for the downfall of that man. Um, unfortunately, I'm not completely sure he's going to be replaced by anybody better. Just a different brand of... Uh, yeah. I'm not sure which words I can say because I can hear your children in the background. And That's right. The doors closed. The doors yeah. closed, and we've got the, I've got the headphones on, but don't offend anyone. I um, yeah. I I mean, people said to me, they said on Twitter that we're definitely MI6 in some way. So there you go. <laughs> I have made a terrible, terrible spy, but it's a lovely thing. <laughs> But that's it. I mean, that's it. You're hiding in plain <laughs> sight. And uh, oh, what can we say? It's like, the... yeah. Anyhow, uh, let's go in. We've got questions. We've got lots of questions and good questions. And they kind of, you know, a lot of them are sort of cross-section questions between them. Uh, a lot about fear, a lot about uncertainty and, and petrol. Uh, so shall we shall we just read out some and and go from there? Do you want to start, Emily? Yes, I've actually paraphrased them on my okay. notebook though, so well, it might be better if you do it to uh all right to get well, the words of the listeners. Okay, so listen, I'm going to read Tigran's first because it's the last to arrive. Actually, Tigran said, "You know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They say that the incoming God, I can't read my the president." is a liar criminal and wants to take their savings tax everything uh they advise people advise on waiting on making any investment into property or businesses in colombia in your circles what are the reactions at the same time julian has said what is already happening before the inauguration of the new president are people really afraid and are they already pulling their money out of Colombia in all, or is it all hat and no cattle? Um, as there's so much rumor, and Petro wanted to make a second Venez as Petro wanted to make a second Venezuela out of Colombia, could you discuss what would happen and what could happen? What could be the best case scenario and the worst case scenario for Colombia? And finally, on this one, there's Javier as well. How's he going to stop the financial flight? That's paraphrased. Uh, people are taking their money out of Colombia and buying property in Miami. How can we attract investors? And what's he going to do about inflation? So I kind of think they all sort of feed into the same thing. You're you can right, jump in right. first, and then I'll jump in. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first thing, whether or not you agree with the concerns, they are... Uh, 
very real and very sincerely felt by a lot of people in Colombia. Um, and I think the mistake of a lot of uh, commentators and journalists is to disregard them as silly or unrealistic. Um, and the, the first thing that you have to do is acknowledge them and ask why they're there. Um, not just because they're real and sincerely felt, but because they also have very serious effects on governability, on financial flight, um, and also the extent to which the international market and the international community, uh, particularly um, major allies to the North, allow this government to govern. Um, these things do matter. Um, in terms of my own circle, people I've spoken to, there are people who are quite concerned. My Im immigrant Venezuelan friends immediately tried to get all of their money out of Colombia. Um, some other friends had a party. You know, <laughs> the, my friends are as divided as the country is. Um, I don't, I don't think the, I don't think Petra wants to make Colombia another Venezuela because nobody wants any country to be another Venezuela. Nobody thinks that's been a success. Nobody. And he does not have ambitions to recreate that model. Nobody does. Um, and while Colombia is not by any means a perfect democracy, I think if he's a liar and a criminal, there will be consequences. There are a lot of eyes on him. Um, so in terms of fears, yes, he's on the left. That's new. That makes people nervous. I, I don't think he's going to achieve a new Venezuela in four years. I think there are checks and balances in place to stop that happening, even were he to wish that, which I don't think that he does. Uh, I'm I'm on 100% on your side uh, on that one with Venezuela. I mean, as I've said on TV and I've said in other places, is the biggest red flag is having Venezuela alongside Colombia. I mean, you know, is there a country that better knows and has better experienced, aside from Venezuela, but from being a neighbor to Venezuela? Mm. I think on the Venezuela topic, he is right to open dialogue with President Maduro. Uh, and, you know, open dialogue, get something done on that border, get something done because at the end of it all it's the venezuelans who are suffering and we have to have a relationship with our neighbor uh on the you, what yeah. you said about all of this and the uncertainty he doesn't want to turn it into venezuela we don't have the oil money in the boom that venezuela had and he certainly doesn't have the full backing of the army the armed forces there's that <laughs> which i think leads really interestingly into one of Becky's questions um, about strongman politics mm. um, and whether or not, or, or even where in the global trend of strongman political leaders being elected or, you know, non-strongman leaders being elected and over various electoral cycles becoming strongman leaders, mm. you know, the, the really big dangerous quote unquote strongman leaders do have the complete backing of the army um and petro does not we've just seen the the retirement of zapatero uh which is sort of clearly a throwing toys out the pram protest resignment resignment resignation Resignation. Apologies. that's covid resignment is english my first language <laughs> impossible to did tell. you study um, english literature i shouldn't <laughs> say it was too long ago um so yeah he hasn't he hasn't got that which makes him much less dangerous over the short term um you know there are leaders who wield very powerful militaries against their people and against government institutions el salvador is an example sending the uh, the military to the supreme court in his first his first little bit as president mm. old, old bukele um so so we have lots of checks and balances um i think often the strong men who are elected to power are elected in in response to a major demand for a, you know a big issue that people want fixed and think they need a strong man to fix mm. those issues are often security or corruption in fact I'm not sure that's what happened in this election. Mm -hmm. um, think, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, well, I also, Becky was talking about the you know, sort of increasing preference for authoritarian strongman rulers. Let's not 
let's you know let's not dismiss the fact that Petro does have authoritarian <laughs> or could have authoritarian tendencies. Yeah, he's not very good at um, delegating, and he's not very good at uh, conciliation. But that said, he has sat down with his you know uh, with his opposite number. He sat down with Rodolfo Hernandez, who came second in the. Uh, in the elections, Rodolfo Hernandez, and who I'm still unsure as to what he was, <laughs> right, left, policy, whatever. He is too. He is too. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Um, and he has sat down with uh, he who shall not be named, Alvaro Uribe, and I just named him. But and that is a question, oh, a question from Tom, who said, "Is the re is this a reason for hope? Uh, the photo of Uribe and Petro is it a collaboration?" Or is it proof that Uribe still hasn't clocked that he is becoming less relevant by the day? Or option, option C, is it both? Or option D, is it neither? <laughs> I think there's a bit of everything there. <laughs> mm. And I'm, I'm, of, I'm of the view that it's both. Yeah. Um, you know, Uribe will struggle to accept his new role in politics, mm. but he does still have an enormous relevance, an enormous sway, not just over... The major opposition party in Congress, who are the Centro Democratico, and a number of major politicians who who still tow his line, um, but also over big swathes of the population. And again, we're talking about governability. We're talking about popular mandate, and there are still a lot of people listening to what Uribe says. For me, it was more you know, in a lot of these meetings and acceptances of different voices in the in the coalition, are more evidence. That, that Petro maybe isn't a strong man in, in the mold that we're seeing. And I don't want to sound too, you know, millennial about it. <laughs> but I think the phrase, uh, the phrase toxic masculinity or just straight up machismo um, is a lot of what we're seeing with some of these leaders. If someone disagrees, they throw a tantrum, <laughs> uh, they throw their toys out the pram, they call that person a traitor of the people. I mean, I'm particularly talking about Bolsonaro and the Supreme Court. <laughs> Um, you know, these are men who don't know how to be disagreed with yeah. and they feel threatened by that. And we're seeing a lot of the opposite with Petro. People who have been, who have said very unflattering things about him <laughs> in the very recent past. You know, I wouldn't sit down and have a coffee with someone who'd said that kind of thing about me a month afterwards. Good on him. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not, I'm not seeing a lot of the ego that he's famous for in these meetings and that to me is very encouraging i had um i had uh yeah we had a, a, a politician and opposition at that time politicians stay with us in Montpos a couple of times uh, and he he asked us our opinion on on petro regarding that kind of toxic masculinity and we said well you know i said, he said whatever happens i hope that he's got over this ability uh, to to appear arrogant the whole time, and as a, and and he, this opposition politician was like he's been working on that fundamentally for months, if not years now, to put bring that down. I wanted before you jumped in, I wanted to say something about the Uribe photo photo opportunity. I mean, we all looked at it, and the memes came out, and it was all hilarious. Yes. And sometimes there was hope, sometimes not. But Uribe, when he came out of it and sort of, you know, posed for the cameras and talked about private property and that his, he, he, for me, he consolidated his role as now the voice, uh, let's say, uh, the stable voice, I think we can say that, of the opposition for that moment. You know, I think it was very clever. Um, you know, I think that his, his star is waning, but as you say, there's a whole load of people who will still listen to what he has to say and still believe him uh, blindly or, or so. But I thought it was very clever the way he did that. And he came out talking about private property, which was for me interesting, because, of course, that's one of the key things. You know, Petra's going to take your pensions, he's going to tax you and he's going to uh, uh, appropriate all the land. So I thought that was very interesting. Very interesting and, and ties into what Tigran asked, which is, mm. you know, people saying that Petra is going to take their savings and their tax assets of middle-class Colombians. And by all accounts, that's that's not the plan. No. Um, taking the assets of the middle class would never be a sensible plan. <laughs> um, he has brought in Ocampo, who I think we should you know mention if we're talking about finance, who's his new finance minister, 
you know, he's a Yale economist, he's worked at the UN, he's had various posts in government, and he's seen as a real, you know, uh, pacifier for the market, right? Mm. Um, but even he is talking about a wealth tax. Mm. But that's that's not that's not middle classes. No. Those are your money deletes, and the wealth tax is for individuals and not for businesses. So they they really are, they will go after private property because that's how taxation works that's tax some of your private property goes to the state and in return you and people less fortunate than you get public services without paying for them that's just how a state is run so yes some private property will be taken um it's called tax it's called tax that's uh, the questions from harry aren't they as well a lot of the um issues of the, you know, the fiscal issues, pension uh, and, of course, agrarian reform. Um, I think, obviously, there's a lot lot to be unwrapped in the whole fiscal side, but I think Ocampo is, is positive. And we know for a fact that uh, Pedro is surrounded by academics who have studied this to, you know, he's, he, they may or may not be friends of his, uh, but they will provide pushback, uh, which is something we haven't seen in the previous four years. Uh, they will provide pushback when he's when he you know he needs to be pushed back, and I think that's something that we need to respect and appreciate. Um, but yes, taxes. I, the, the, what it, I don't even know what the the you know the, the the percentage of actually tax income is in Colombia, but we know it's very low. It's very low, and the agrarian form will provide another form of tax income. Um, on an industry that is not very taxed, uh, rarely taxed meaningfully at all, according according to the new uh, minister, uh, Celia Lopez, I think, who's going to be doing the, uh, the agrarian reform. Um, so if they make that sector more productive and they do manage to actually tax it um, and do some form of agrarian reform by which people have access to land, you know, that could be a drive the economy that's petro's plan that's what he says you know and the way that he distinguishes his plan from that of venezuela is that it will not be oil driven development mm. he says that agriculture will be the new oil of colombia um that's a big ask i mean we actually didn't get any questions specifically about agrarian reform because it's quite dull and knotty and i get that um <laughs> but it is going to be a big focus i think you know right. it's it's 200 years overdue much like a government that's interested in social reform. <laughs> and and it's got Celia Lopez, who's a pretty impressive pretty impressive woman in her 70s, big history behind her. But she's up against some of the most powerful people in the country. Mm. I mean, the cattle ranchers, I mean, that makes them sound like cowboys. We're talking huge landowners and enormous businesses who are historically immensely corrupt and linked mm. to some quite dangerous, violent people. You know, if we're if we're getting direct about it, which apparently I just did, um, that's who she's up against. That's what this reform is pushing up against. So it, it's a big one. Yeah, uh, Colombia is the country which hasn't had a land reform in South America. I mean, let's 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 go there and and it, you know, point one on the peace accords, mm. point one mm. on on almost anything. And so they will have to do something about this. They will have to. I, you know, I don't know where you start. I don't know where it goes, but there has to be something. There has to be, and yeah. of course, it comes into, of course, you know, protected lands, stolen lands, displaced mm. people. It adopts everything, and of course, you bring in the tax side. Now, that extractive industry that you obviously people asked about that. Ben asked about the analysis relating to Petro's like plans to for extractives. It doesn't, to me, I'll stick my neck out, seem unreasonable that Gustavo Petro has a plan to adopt all renewables within 12 years. That's the plan, as I know it. Everything that has been signed off on in terms of extractors continues, but nothing more. Um, obviously, there's a big problem if things get caught in limbo. Obviously, this is a huge deal for international investors. But I also think on the flip side, an international community and international governments are also happy to see, you know, progressives, happy to see uh, a, a country 
coming, let's say, in a post-accord situation. I don't even know what I say because I'm not going to say post-conflict, but post-accord situation, moving towards these sort of uh, ideals. I think it's a positive thing. I don't know if saying <laughs> or, or misquoting Petro on extractives was ever a good thing. It was the easiest thing to attack him on. A huge portion of Colombia's, if not most of <laughs> Colombia's economy comes from these things. So do we think that he will go down the route of sort of, how do I say it, Boric in, in Chile, where he promised a lot of things and then watered it down immensely? He'll have to, won't he? <laughs> I mean, that is also totally normal. <laughs> um, you get into government with an enormous raft of plans that you then have four years and a budget, a Congress and a political opposition in order to reform. I mean, this is totally normal governance stuff. <laughs> uh, Sandra Botero, who's a, an amazing political analyst, I, I often um, pester in order to, in order to get a... Get ideas and analysis from said you know that's that's totally to be expected mm -hmm. and it's very possible that that will be painted as exceptional mm -hmm. um because you know there is a big opposition to petro and lots of people i mean he said himself and i i will for my subscribers um translate and share this interview with petro in el pais because it's it's a really amazing mm. a piece of long form and he says this is it if we fail and i quote the darkness will come and sweep everything away. That's literally what he said. I think he's acutely aware of the stakes. Yeah. And if he fails, that will be evidence that the left does not work in Colombia or that the left cannot work in Latin America. Um, but it is totally reasonable to expect that only a small proportion of the promises or the you know the electoral campaign promises will be fulfilled. I think that's normal, and I think he's very prepared for that. Mm. He's certainly implemented ministers. Ocampo has already moderated a lot of what was mm. promised, um, which is a great comfort to a lot of people too. I think. Oh, that was um, who was it who said that about? Uh, uh, yeah, hang on a second. Let me just check through because someone said something interesting. Ah, Zach, uh, and he says, you know. Petro's selection of finance minister was designed to install confidence and stability. Instill confidence and stability. Is this a harbinger of Petro, his financial policies, or merely a nod to international financial markets? What is the likelihood that Petro will be hamstrung in any large scale financial reform, similarly to how uh, he was hamstrung in some ways as the mayor of Bogota or does? He have a critical mass in Congress to support dramatic reforms. And that kind of feeds into Harry's other question about the sort of breakdown. Critical mass, I mean, on paper, he now has uh, a majority with the Liberal Party and the U Party. So that's the party of U uh, national unity, <laughs> the U Party. Uh, but of course, they are as uh, flip floppy as, as, as they want to be on anything and everything. And if uh, Cesar Gaviria, former president, who has thrown his toys a few times in the last couple of months, Petro knew he had to make a deal with him because he wouldn't otherwise, I mean, it would have been impossible. Petro has known he has to get the U party on board, but that was largely done by, of course, Benedetti and Roy Barreras, who he brought on, you know, very, very uh, capable political chameleons, <laughs> I think best way of putting it. Um, he has on paper a majority. That does not mean that anything is going through. I'm, uh, <laughs> no, not, neither do they have the sort of three-line whip system that we have here in the UK where people are forced to vote along party lines, right? Mm. Um, so there's lots of opportunity for in-party dissent. Um, I, I think my only real response is that we'll see. Yeah, it, it, um, it's hard, that one. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, the breakdown, obviously, as you can see, it breakdown. Do you have the figures on the breakdown for Harry? Um, on Congress? Yeah. Um, I actually had the Registra Duria app, and it has broken. Um, it doesn't sound and the, the website is <laughs> such garbage. Um, I do, in one of my old uh, notes for my briefing, <laughs> have the congressional outline. Um, and Sia Vasia, actually, let me... Hang also, on. Richard, I think there's there's something hitting up against your microphone, or maybe it's like a pen tapping. Oh, yeah, I will stop that. But it's a really loud 
Um, it's a, it's wait, a pen because me... I'm I'm like ah, that. Ah, okay. <laughs> I think like it's that. just it's just quite close to the mic as well. Okay. Okay, let me. I do always recommend Sia Vasia for yeah, um, graphics. Mm -hmm. They just um, they really put together a good graphic. Equally on the um, equally on the Truth Commission report, they've done mm. some really good stuff. Fantastic report. Hard going, fantastic. You must mention that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that Gustavo Petro was there for the inauguration of the, the report is, is very important. Uh, and in keeping with his presidency, Ivan Duque was in Portugal uh, protecting oceans. Yeah, cl classic. Classic Ivan, that. <laughs> um... <laughs> that. I mean, honestly, that of all things. But then again, are we yeah. surprised? No. No, deep, deeply, <laughs> deeply not. I think, you know, he is slowly tapping out, uh, paving the way to become, I mean, my bets on highly paid international environmental consultant. Yep. Um, yep. And we'll all find that darkly amusing, but that's where my money is for his, you know, if Tony Blair can be one of the world's best paid Middle Eastern co consultants, nearly said a different word there, uh, <laughs> then, then who knows? For Duque, you know, yeah, you know, and Uribe went up and did uh, classes at uh, Georgetown, and uh, so there you go. <laughs> it's, it's all it's all to play for because yeah. there are not enough eyes on this country, um, and people can get away with all kinds of rubbish in the aftermath of their own actions. Um, okay, here we are. Yeah. I've found because of. Um, all of that mess with preconteo and oh, scrutiny. Yeah. Obviously, it all got a little bit confused. Right, so Pacto Historico has 19. So it is the biggest party in Congress. And that is as well, you have to, a coalition of leftist parties. So it's not as if they're going to blindly vote with him as well. Right, I mean, this is the thing again and about not having not having a whip system is that you can you can count your seats, but not your chickens, I think, would be <laughs> the, the simplest way to put this. Um, and again, you know, lots of negotiation happens. He's mm. still appointing ministers. We've got a real broad church in in terms of ministers. Lots of different experiences, lots of different parties being brought in. Mm. So it does matter. Um, and if if people are pissed off with Petro or the coalitions fall apart, that will be difficult because he does not have a majority. Mm. Um but in terms of what positively could happen, I think it'll really it'll depend on the proposal and on and on the lobbying. You know, there are lots of interests in Colombia um, outside of things that count, the things that people voted for, that will be huge factors in in whether or not Petro can uh, fulfil his party promises. Very jump in at that moment because i did see someone write about you know there won't be protests because uh yeah, petro and francia marquez mm. are, are, are you know, supported by those who got out and protested and i think that was totally off base because the people mm, who are take. most yeah most likely to go out and protest i think are the people who voted for petro if he doesn't fulfill some of the promises in, in particular i would say you know, security for social community leaders, um, land reform, uh, peace accords, and environmental considerations. I think those were was many of the issues that got people out into the streets. And now, of course, inflation and and you know cost of living. And I think you you will, he will be given a small amount of time, and will have to sort of you know, hang that carrot before, ahead of the donkey, giving, you know, a, a, snib, a nibble at a time to keep them uh, pleased, because otherwise I think they'll go out on the streets. I, I agree. I also think it's something of a, a myth that only lefties protest. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of things uh, that could get people out on the streets. There are lots of people who weren't on the streets before who might now get out on the streets. The number of protests that are listed by ACLED, who's a really interesting think tank, mm -hmm. um, who does a lot of research on, um, which does a lot of research on protest activity, riots and civil unrest, as well as on conflict. Um, they register an enormous number of anti-democratic protests. Mm -hmm. So protests, you know, Bolsonaro was able to call enormous protests mm -hmm. 
against the Supreme Court, some of which were calling for military rule again. Protests are not just about peace and human rights. Protests can be about lots of things. Um, so we could well be facing more, more street demonstrations. Um, I don't think we'll reach the, the level of the Paro Nacional again, but I certainly do think it's a rather um, specific right-wing Colombian take that Petro was the reason that people were on the streets and his lot will not get on the streets again. Mm. Um, he certainly allied himself to those protests. Yeah, of course. But I certainly don't believe he was the reason for them. I was I was annoyed at that whole thing of him taking, he took, you know, to, tried to take some credit, didn't he? He tried to take some, and that annoyed me a bit because it took away from the, because the, there was, at the beginning, and there was when in Bogota more than anywhere, I think, an organic kind of growth to them. And then Petro getting in obviously gave fuel to his uh, detractors. And let's recall this, this election really wasn't about policy. It was, it was Petro, yes or no. Let's remember that. It was, are you voting for Petro or are you not? And 10 million people voted against, they voted no. And so this is going to be hard. It definitely is. Um, and honestly, I I wrote an article on this, um, so I might be biased, but a lot of the people who voted for Petro weren't even voting for Petro. They mm -hmm. were voting for Francia Marquez. Mm -hmm. um, and if she doesn't get the the profile um, and the amount of power that, that her voters believe that she is due, I think that could be another obstacle um, to having a real popular mandate for him because certainly she was not stood behind him she was stood beside him she was on the campaign materials she was right out there gaining him voters and if, if we look at the vote changes to the left a lot of them were in her homelands places she voted a lot of people i spoke to in calca on the pacific on the caribbean said we did not vote for petro we voted for francia he would not have won without her there are people yeah. who are unequivocal in that belief um and honestly, a lot of the vote analysis totally stands behind that. Um, since the election, I've seen a lot less of her. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, putting nice, shiny Ocampo, white men who've studied at Yale forward um, to, to soothe the markets, to soothe, you know, the opposition. Um, but I think it's important in this government to remember who and why actually got the votes who actually got the votes and why i haven't spoken much at all in the last six days because i've been in bed with my english is uh yeah that's quite okay. sure what's going on there that's okay and i think you're, you're yeah, again totally on point with the francia marquez and i knew i know of people anti-petristas who voted for petro mm. because mm. of francia marquez of course she's vice president so he can't kick her out um that's the no. rule for vice presidency and and she will have a strong uh, line on the environment and of course traditional communities and overseen or what are they called the uh, what did she say the, the, the nadies the nobodies in Los the country nadie. Los nadie. yeah which is uh, always to be put in quote marks because uh, yes. it it's, it's a quote from a great poem um, by oh. Eduardo Galeano who oh, wrote the open veins of, of Latin America, of Latin America mm. um, as well as a lot of great poetry mm. and that is a poem very specifically about the the marginalized of Latin America mm. Um, and I think it's, I do think it's important to note that that was yes. edited out of every article I wrote for the Times. Just going to throw <laughs> that in there as a bit They're not listening. Aside. They're not listening. Uh, <laughs> this is too much. Nobody cares about this. I think it's important because nobody, to have it outside of quotes or outside of context, certainly outside of Colombia, you forget that she was never saying they were nobody. Nobody believes they're nobody. Yeah. Um, within the left and, you know, most social movements, that's a really famous poem. And Los Nadies is a really specific reference. Yeah. Well, we've got some questions about security. Uh, Martin has asked about violence increased or decreased since the Petro win. Frankly, I couldn't tell you. I would imagine it's continuing. I, I, I would imagine yes. that people are getting, I, I hate to say it, uh, the groups or whomever is it, are getting things done before August 9th when Petro gets in. Or, and it's business as usual, I would imagine, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you know, my news monitoring, massacres continue, murders of former FARC combatants continue, 
ni neither candidate took a particularly strong stance on security. Um, you know, law and order was really Fico's line. Um, and, you know, that went when he did. Um, lots of, I think, very good structural proposals from Petro about how to limit the power of armed groups in the long term. I don't imagine they'll be quaking in their boots in the short term. Mm. The Colombian army currently has no general. Um, <laughs> neither candidate proposed any particular policy for the short term. And I think that's, that is something, you know, and I'm, I'm not uh, a law and order security right winger, though I have written on these issues a bit. There are a lot of people living in pretty difficult circumstances that need an immediate solution. Mm. Um, and not just a humanitarian one, a security one. Mm. Um, and neither candidate proposed that. And I've not, I've not seen much on that since. Um, so certainly they'll be getting on with business. I think under Hernandez, it would have been a free for all, quite frankly. I don't think the man had a clue. He certainly didn't have allies in the security or, or military sector. Um, but like that's definitely a valid concern as far as I'm concerned. You know, what is going to be done in the short term? Mm. And Rich, Rich uh, asked that human rights defenders, is, are, are things going to get better for them? I mean, hard one. I would imagine that Petro has will make some statements whether things can be carried out in these regions. And of course, if he doesn't have the full backing of the military, we, I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen with the security plans and the use of the security forces. One of Petro's... Mm. Uh, statements has been to separate the police force from the Ministry of Defense, which many people have been calling for for a long time. Including uh, the UN. Including the UN. In, uh, and of course, I think it was mentioned in the Truth Commission as well, all of these things. Mm. Uh, so hopefully he can move forward on that because it's, it, you know, it's it, this is not about national sovereignty. This is about a sort of internal, uh, um, what would you call it? Uh, cohabiting <laughs> in this land <laughs> right yeah and I, I think in terms of um you know i think there are levels of human rights defense in mm. terms of citizens being on the streets we are going to see improvements mm. particularly if the police come out from under the ministry of defense which is a uniquely colombian <laughs> phenomenon one very tied up with the civil war and the narco wars perhaps legitimate in that time late no longer maybe yeah yeah, I mean, there, there is no excuse for that any longer. We do not need militarized police forces. That sort of police force's interaction with protests, according to all research and data, immediately creates or exacerbates violence at protests. Mm -hmm. Those are the facts. Those are what the studies say. Um, so in terms of that, we are going to see improvements, I think. In terms of the human rights defenders who are being murdered in Colombia's rural regions, because Colombia has the highest number of murdered human rights defenders in the world per year, again, third year running. Mm -hmm. And they also have 40% of the global total. So it's not just a bit more. And the next two countries down are Brazil and Mexico. So we, you know, we know what the causes are. We know what the patterns are. Whether or not Petra is able to get a handle on security and armed groups in the short term will be the deciding factor on that. Um, but we do again have Francia Marquez. We finally have someone in government who, who actually has experience of these things. She was an activist. She has been threatened by armed groups and she survived an assassination attempt. So it's not simply that she really cares about these issues. It's also that she understands at a granular level how these things happen and what the context is. So we may see a policy that actually makes sense in context. So in, in with, this, uh, with this in mind, we're gonna slide in a, a, a voice file here from expert on security issues, Kyle Johnson, and, and he will have uh, updates for us on this and his uh, thoughts. He was on the podcast many, many months ago talking about Arauca, talking about what's going on, the different armed groups controlling different areas. Uh, he spends a lot of time on the border. Um, and, and so that's, we'll obviously put in the show notes, his company and everything else so to follow up. So we'll have this now. And then coming back from that, we'll come back. And then we need to talk about, Emily, we need to talk about 
I'm trying to look and see who else has written. There's been, you know, one of the things is, you know, I was talking to a Colombian the other day here in London who was saying, you know, he saw people crying when Petro got in, which I think is kind of extreme. I mean, the people, one, and a friend of my wife said, you know, Richard is very, very left wing. And, and Alec, uh, she went, he really isn't. He's just very critical. <laughs> it's just very critical. And then she was, the friend was like, yeah, you're right. We do have the worst. <laughs> so. I think there's also something to be said here for a, a centering of the United States mm. um, in on the political spectrum. Imagining that the US is a sort of neutral zero point on the barometer of politics and that Colombia is only just to the right mm. and anyone who thinks that a state should provide services or charge taxes is somehow very left wing. Um, and in, in terms of Colombia's history, we are looking at historic leftness. Mm. But if we look at the global context, you know, further than the, frankly, fascist and crass, unrestrained capitalist goings on of the United States of only the last two weeks, not even to speak on the general political system. You're gonna, but really you're gonna see. alienate. Our, I mean, the listeners. banning of abortion, the unrestrained oh, yeah. sale of arms, and saying that the country has no right to rule on uh, carbon outputs. I mean, this is not a neutral space that we're talking about, <laughs> and it must not be used as one on a political barometer. Mm. You know, as a person from Europe, we have a national health service. Mm. We have taxes of between 40 and 50% on the highest earnings of the wealthy, and we do not consider ourselves socialist. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think we have to take into account the context, but also pull out a bit and say, okay, so, you know, is left or right a useful, meaningful way to talk about this? Mm. And how left wing is it really in the global context? A lot of what's being proposed. Mm. I, I, I just think a lot of it's just, yeah. again, coming from a European context, it just doesn't seem outrageous. Uh. No, again, and <laughs> if you said to even the most right wing people in Colombia, you know, would you like to live in a country that looks like Sweden? A lot of them would say, yes, that yes. sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> and that's a country where taxes are incredibly high, even by European standards. Yeah. And so are public services and maternity leave and benefits. I mean, what's considered socialist and what isn't um, is uneven and often unfair. I found one of my own articles on a tweet or being tweeted with the expression socialist regime um, before, before Petro has even taken power, a certain newspaper's Twitter manager uh, decided that it's a socialist regime. Um, oh, wow. And you and were tweeted on that? Yes, luckily not tagged. Um, <laughs> but I certainly hadn't used the expression. You know, I, the word regime is, is a rather strong one. <laughs> Uh, not one that I would pick, but you, you see what I mean. I mean, mm. there's a real unevenness to the way that we label mm. governments and policies depending on where, where we're from and, and how big our perspective is. This, this puts in quite an interesting uh, uh, comment. I think it's from, hang on a second, looking here. It's Rich again. Um, so this puts uh, Colombia kind of, what, what do you think about Colombia on the world stage with, with Petro in power? And I think there's something incredibly positive from it. I mean, I, I you know, I think there's something positive that hopefully it's someone who can go overseas and, and present a more, I don't know, human face, maybe, I don't know, but... Uh, I guess if people are shifting left, shifting right, as you say, or want, don't want to say, is this a bad thing? I don't know. I don't. I mean, we're we're everywhere, aren't we? All over this. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, to me, I I'm not sure that Petra is a very human face. There's there's still something rather grandiose about his way of addressing even one-on-one -on -one interviews. Mm. Um. His, his use of rhetoric, even the sort of rhythms mm. of the way he speaks. Um, there's a very self-conscious statesmanship going on there um, that maybe is absolutely necessary. You know, 
I certainly never sat down with Biden. I don't know what's required there in terms of social graces. Um, I don't think it'll happen to me. I don't think I'll ever need to worry about it. But <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure he's a human face as such. Um, but he's certainly more of an adult face than Ivan Duque. Um, certainly that, what was that? Was it BBC Sounds? That dreadful interview. Oh, hard it's talk. awful. A hard talk with, uh, where I he, can't remember. Where he sort of did his usual sort of talking in incomprehensible statistics for a full half hour. Mm. Um, and then at the end, when he was signing off, said this show should be called Hard Lies. And then wandered off. I mean, it was so so childish mm. and embarrassing and I, I think Petro makes Colombia look like a, a serious proper country in a way that Duque didn't to do yeah I think that, I think you're right on that on that hard talk one because he kept saying and it's been his policy now and uh Vice President Marta Lucia Ramirez's policy just to say you know uh, we've we're backed up by facts we're backed up by statistics which are immediately uh you're able to question them immediately or they're just the statistics i mean obviously that he prefers they prefer to show uh and and you know there was there was no room for debate at all on that uh it, you know whoever it was i don't know jonathan i don't remember who was the interviewer but you know he, he presented the opposition and they they they, re they resent it and then they say well i don't i don't follow uh, social media gossip I've got the hard facts, which seems so easy to. And at the end, at the same time, it felt to me that Duque was expecting, you know, like his own auto interview uh, that was in English sent out uh, during the Paro Nacional, which is like, no, you, you're going to have a credible journalist asking you questions. Uh, and on the on the Petro thing, I interviewed him many years ago when he was mayor. I also worked for him for two weeks. <laughs> that, two weeks is kind of like my 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 cutoff point for jobs. But um, I worked for two. He's I, but I interviewed him, and actually, you're very right. Now I recall, he sits uh, in a in a loose fashion. Fashion, I would say, not as bad as uh, Rhys Mogg, uh, <laughs> but he sits very relaxed, and it is yeah, the rhetoric is there, and it's not. You know, you don't feel like you're chatting to a person. You're, you're someone who's far superior to you. Which, you know, is, is a very traditional form of... I, I, don't, I don't need politicians to be a sort of sweaty, blubbering <laughs> Boris Johnson-style wreck. I don't need that level of humanness. You know, a certain... <laughs> not... Uh, you know, completely bash on the man, but I, I did meet him once, and, and he kept his bike helmet on the entire time. He was slightly pissed and very sweaty, and wearing his bicycle helmet. Just, I, I just, just a ridiculous, ridiculous man. And I, it would be nice, you know, to see, see a statesman with a, a level of um, grace slightly above that. Um, but you're right, louche. I think louche and aloof. And such words still still do apply, <laughs> Petro. But you know, he's the president of a republic. Yeah. Maybe you're maybe you're allowed a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> I like. I can just imagine Boris with his hat on still, and and obviously half pissed. And I imagine probably left his hat on in case he fell over. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just lost you for like okay. thirty seconds. Okay, I said, oh well, a second. I think I imagine he left his hat on uh, in case he fell over, half pissed, you know. <laughs> and then probably took it off to ride home. I mean, <laughs> I just anyway. <laughs> let's 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 sort of tie up. I'm just going to look through and see if there's anything we haven't covered. And I know that Ben, well, no, Zach as well asked about the sort of mayor of Bogota, and you know, and he said, you know, that, that would seem to have been. Um, a major stepping stone towards gaining wider credibility since formerly being uh, an armed rebel. How was it that a former armed rebel became mayor of Colombia's capital? And how, this has not served to affording him wider credibility, even amongst the non-leftist electorate. I, it, there's so much stigma attached to being the left in Colombia. And also in return, response to that, 
Colombia is kind of the rebellious city when it com comes to voting in that fashion. Uh, you, you know, there's there's a counterweight in the Palacio Llevano sitting alongside the Congress and the Palacio Nariño, and it just seems to go that way a bit. It, uh, I don't know. I, I, again, Bogota being, uh, you described it actually as the more adult city in a, in a question and answer some so some some months ago <laughs> well, that's the sort of thing i would say yeah and so i i kind of feel i feel on that a bit it's it's just the bogota votes differently uh it being the big um the big city with with sort of all walks of life in that one so i just i just get that one and the mayoralty is you know when i talked to a friend in bucaramanga who was voting for rodolfo and i said you know you have to understand that rodolfo wasn't that successful as mayor of Bucaramanga. He, he has his position on um, corruption, so he froze every single contract in the city, which meant for four years you had every construction job um, frozen. I mean, it was all up in the air and on bricks. Now, I'm not saying that freezing contracts to weed out corruption is the wrong thing to do, but it left the city on bricks. Uh, and she said, the response was, well, Petro wasn't a great mayor of Bogota either. No, uh, under no circumstances can we say he was, but the dialogue and the narrative surrounded the, you know, the failure of the uh, waste disposal scheme, scheme. That's what we talk about. He brought gun violence way down. He, he did bring sort of water and electricity and recognized that South Bogota existed. Uh, and, it, you know, there was a more socially minded on that front, which we can't say for a lot of mayors. <laughs> we can't say. But I don't think about he did annoy everybody by getting up on the balconies and hollering. <laughs> you know, that he uh, hollering to the International Court and Human Rights and the International American International Court and whatever, uh, that things weren't going to get done. And I, that's what I fear for the presidency. <laughs> mm, my, my hope is that he knows that the stakes are too high for that now. Mm, hope so. Yeah, um, I hope so, too. Uh, yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, ben had a, obviously a plan for the tourism sector. That was one of his. That was one of his questions. And I mean, as someone who works in tourism, Petro has identified tourism as a major economic driver in the country. So whatever that means, it's a good thing. <laughs> I don't know what that means yet. I don't know if that means improved infrastructure. I don't know if that means more grassroots uh, grassroots um, uh, involvement, which I would think is the most important from my perspective in a small town, grassroots involvement, getting communities involved on the ground, getting the people uh, in these small towns involved in tourism, making it sustainable economically and environmentally is a huge step. I, I don't know where else to say. I mean, tourism will, will be a driver if you manage it correctly. <laughs> that's that's more or less what I can say. We, well, I just I kind of steer clear of uh, of getting involved in the political side of things and just try and do things correctly from my own little corner. <laughs> that's a, are there any other things that you we've missed out? Uh, um, there uh, was a question about whether or not major industrialists ah, are yeah. meeting with Petro. Um, Martin. Yes, I've certainly not seen it reported. If they are. Uh, the Andy, uh, the association of like businesses and yep. stuff, have 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 kind of made statements that they're prepared to meet. I think uh, they may well have met, but I don't know. Yeah, I think that's you know that's definitely an interesting question in the you know the broad church coalition that's being built, mm. um, and lots of good profiling of you know I am meeting with this person from the right, I am meeting with this person from the center. Um, we're not seeing so much of the direct contact with mm. those sectors profiled in terms of PR. Um, though I noticed six former paramilitary leaders are joining the, the Acuerdo Nacional. So it really is wow. the broadest of churches. Uh, <laughs> but whether or, whether or not the big industrialists will join up, I don't know. I mean, you know, the model of big industry in Colombia is, is often monopolies which are what Petro is saying that he wants to tackle. So, uh, yeah. 
So let's let's finish up with uh, Julian again, and he said there's so much rumor around petrol. Well, that's the Venezuela, but he said, you know, what's the worst? What would and could be the best and worst case scenario for Colombia? Well, the best case scenario is petrol could carry out some actually socially minded, economically sustainable uh, policies which bring Colombia forward into the 21st century, <laughs> and and enable uh, you know, uh, public education for all and uh, that the the poorest can eat three meals a day again I think and land reform and everything but well, the worst case scenario for me is that everything is held in limbo and nothing gets done or only partially done leaving it worse off sort of like a like a half built property or something I don't know I mean what have, what have you thought about this yeah I, I agree best case scenario whether or not you know the pendulum swings back right is that there will be uh, you know there has been a demonstrated desire we've ticked that box but a, a demonstrated capacity for the government to provide state services to people who have not had them <laughs> and when we talk about a swing to the left you know these are not people who've like read Mein Kampf and then read Capital and been like, oh, I, I think I think Marx was right, not Hitler. That's not what we're talking about here at all. No. We're talking about people who see a chance for positive change in their own conditions of life. Um, and Petro and Francia Marquez have promised that. So the best case scenario is that we see a shift in governments towards governments who want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. who want to not redistribute all wealth or create agriculture camps we're not we're not talking about that we're <laughs> we're talking about reaching people providing something in exchange for the taxes that you that you charge um of course worst case scenario is that it's all a complete disaster and the pendulum swings hard right again and we go back to governments whose only real aim is shaking hands with US presidents and ripping out coca bushes and putting heads on sticks and saying, oh, look, I've got the leader of the Gulf plan. Like, have you? Or is there a new one immediately? Because, you know, I mean, so worst case scenario for me is, is continuity, frankly, yeah. and a more interesting continuity. That, uh, the, 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 that uh, answer on all fronts that the capture of Ortoniel has contributed to greater security for social and community leaders is something that riles me every single time it's like oh we captured it and it's just like and then the paro nacional occurred and showed that you have no control over however much of the country i don't know you but you're going to get me on something that i'm i'm likely to uh, <laughs> to, to rant about <laughs> but we have got cross-institutional consensus on this now uh, so the truth commission report said the current security model does not contribute in a meaningful way to security mm. we get less security with the current security model extradition does not help eradication of crops when it's in a forced manner does not help um, and that's an independent six-year thousand page report that petro has said that he will comply with um so we're not we're not just talking sort of single man theories. We're now talking various institutions and checks and balances are all in favor of a change mm. towards, you know, no more heads on sticks, no more crop eradication by force and no more uh, internal enemy attitudes, yeah. which are I another major problem. And I think that 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 kind of um, that kind of uh, ties in nicely to people who asked about the peace accords. I mean, if Petro is planning to to follow the the. the you know the, the dialogue and the what what is in the uh, what do you call it again the, the the truth commission then that's that's very much the 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 peace accords really and and what what is being addressed there anything you want to say emily well, quite, yeah. <laughs> anything else any more for Gosh, any more no. <laughs> we've covered a lot into covid, COVID brainy and and ranty we have covered a lot i'm just looking over my list of questions and Frankly, I, I don't I want anyone to be left covered. out i mean I, javier i feel that i didn't ask about in, to say anything about inflation it's it's global i mean we're all we're going to get to 11 percent here in uk i don't know what we can do for that um and uh, the financial flight is not something new in colombia uh those who can 
you know, or have too much, <laughs> maybe get it out. I don't know. It's not something new that people invest in Miami. I, you know, I, I no, the I banking would also system in Colombia. Yeah, I mean, one of the other issues with Colombia, of course, in terms of financial flight, is corruption and money laundering. If you're worried about the money that's leaving Colombia, don't look to the few in the middle classes who are able to get their money out. Look at the very visibly wealthy in Colombia who set up enormous businesses in Miami, who have property empires in Florida, who are suddenly very rich and nobody knows why, who launder millions of millions of dollars worth of filthy money mm. through cattle companies, through, let's say, large supermarket chains that we won't mention the name of. This this is the sort of financial flight that I, I think the focus will shift towards under Petro. Mm. Um, and again, you know, the concerns of Colombians about their money and about politics are real and are valid and need to be addressed. Um, but actually the amount of money that's leaving Colombia from those sorts of flights is much less than the amount of illegitimate money that could be brought under tax and under state control, if managed well. I think we'll leave it there, Emily. I think we've spoken massively about this. I wish you all the best in this recovery. Don't go to the cinema again. <laughs> that's where it happened. Certainly not to see the film Elvis, and I don't want to start a war on Twitter. But good God, was that a waste of time? I was going to. I was going to say. At least I hope the film was good. But you saw Elvis. It, it, was it that Baz Luhrmann? Is that Baz Luhrmann? It was, Lerman? and I am. I am patchily a Luhrmann fan yeah. on and off. Um, but that. Did I'd he be, do I the mean, Romeo and Juliet? Was that the he he did did, Romeo and Juliet, which was great for teenagers. <laughs> incredible yeah. that, i watched that romeo and juliet every couple of years it's completely fantastic yeah. moulin rouge if you're i've never you know, that, hung over enough is a decent <laughs> film but this was a mess come okay. for me on twitter i'm ready for it <laughs> that's it's one uh, of the worst films at, i've seen in years. at emily underscore h underscore h Get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's out there for everyone listen listen thank you so much emily get better we're three three minutes thank apart you. at some point in the next month where our paths will I, cross I, in I person so. have a great time in paris if, i if shall not. i shall when this comes out i will be in paris for the first time ever I've never been to Paris before. Really? So taking the family to Paris. Yes. How lovely. Yes. How lovely. Enjoy. So, so and now we'll go over to a few words from our sponsors. Thank you to Emily Hart again. Another great episode, 432. And we'll be back next week, of course. Uh, some point this summer, we'll take a week off. <laughs> because it is the summer holidays. But uh, uh, we will take a week off. But um, yes, we'll be back next week, of course, with more interviews and conversations about things Columbia related. Emily is getting better because she can talk. And of course, her <laughs> so coherent and so on the ball. We are always very grateful to that. Be Thanks please. for having me. Yeah. And we are always happy uh, for those of you out there supporting us on Patreon. A thank you to William, who signed up this week in Bogota to support us on Patreon. Pa Patreon.com forward slash Columbia Calling. That's our for the week. And goodbye. <laughs>